This is the Bugatti Chiron Super Sport 300 Plus, which has a recorded top speed of 304.7 miles an hour, or 490 kilometers an hour. This monster has an 8 liter W16 engine producing nearly 1,600 horsepower. The list price? About 3.5 million euros. Now, this is a 2022 Formula One car. The actual price of an F1 car is unknown, but they're rumored to cost over $20 million each or something. I'm pretty sure people just make these numbers up, but they are expensive, okay? They're very expensive. These things have an insane hybrid power unit producing 1,000 horsepower from this little 1.6 liter V6 turbo and an electrical motor. The top speed of a Formula One car is only about 350 kilometers an hour. So how is the world's most technically advanced race car that much slower than a street legal hypercar that costs about six times less? Well, where do we start? Gentlemen, a short view back to the past. The fastest Formula One car that we've seen on a racing circuit was the Williams of Valtteri Bottas in 2016 at Baku. His car hit a top speed of 378 kilometers an hour on a 2.2 kilometer long straight, but we're still quite a far way off the Bugatti at 490 kilometers an hour. Many of the limitations on the top speed of a Formula One car are actually to do with the regulations, and you've also got to optimize the car not only to be fast in a straight line, but also to go through corners quickly. So what happens if you take a Formula One car off the track, break all the rules, and ignore the corners, and you just go straight? In 2006, Honda Racing F1 team attempted to do exactly this with their Project Bonville 400. Now, in order to reduce the drag on the car, the engineers took the rear wing off and they put a vertical fin to add stability, and they set out the goal to break 400 kilometers an hour in a Formula One car. The V10 engine in this car propelled the Honda to an average speed of 397.481 kilometers an hour. They were unfortunately unsuccessful in breaking the 400 kilometer an hour barrier. But why aren't Formula One cars faster? There are literally road cars out there faster than a Formula One car. Well, I wasn't even really gonna make this video until I posted a short video talking about the drag level of a Formula One car, and then I read some of the comments. So here's a short clip of that video. The end of a long straight, an F1 car will approach VMAX or maximum velocity. This means the car is no longer accelerating, but holding a constant speed somewhere around 320 kilometers an hour or 200 miles an hour. But the fact that the car is no longer accelerating means that there's 1000 horsepower required just to match the aerodynamic drag acting on the car at the speed. With that much drag, when the driver lifts off the accelerator, the deceleration experienced by the car would be greater than if you were driving your road car, slammed the brake on as hard as you possibly could without locking up. That's a lot of drag. So there were six big misconceptions that I saw repeated over and over in the comments. So let's talk about all of them. But be sure to keep score and let me know how many of these misconceptions that you might've been victim to. Literally keep score and tell me at the end of the video how many you got right. Leave it in a comment below. Now here's the first misconception from the original video. And I need to put my hand up on this one because it's not actually a misconception. I stated that the top speed of a Formula One car is about 320 kilometers an hour. And a lot of people said a Formula One car can go a lot faster than 320, and they're right. So if you got that one, you get a point already. But the top speed of a Formula One car varies quite a bit from event to event. So here are the ranges of all the top speeds from this season. The bars indicate the range of top speeds in qualifying for all the teams, and the black dots indicate the average speed for that circuit. There's something interesting here. I mean, we've got Monaco and Singapore down here below 300 kilometers an hour, and then we've got circuits like Miami, Belgium, and Italy all over 340 kilometers an hour. And then here we've got Mexico, the highest top speed in qualifying this year at nearly 350 kilometers an hour. So maybe on average, 320 kilometers an hour was close, it's definitely low, but it's definitely not the fastest an F1 car has gone this season. So why does the top speed of a Formula One car vary so much throughout a season? And what's the limiting factor? Now, the second big misconception is that Formula One cars have plenty of power to go faster than 320 or even 350 kilometers an hour. And this might be correct, but you really can't just compare the engine power alone. You've got to consider the entire car. Formula One cars actually produce quite a bit of horsepower from a tiny little 1.6 liter turbo V6 engine and this little beefy electrical motor. But by the rules, 160 horsepower come from the electric motor called the MGUK, and the remainder of that 1,000 horsepower comes from the internal combustion engine. Ferrari were rumored to be working on the external combustion engine this season, but that was not particularly popular with the fans. Another important thing to keep in mind is that combustion engines typically have a pretty narrow window of operation, or what we call the power band. Formula One engines are allowed to rev all the way to 15,000 RPM. But if you take a step back and look at the data that we have access to, you can see that the engines spend almost all their time between 10,000 and 12,000 RPM. 
and they rarely exceed 13,000 RPM in eighth gear. But in order to understand what's limiting the top speed of a Formula One car, we need to look at a couple more misconceptions first and start to build up the rest of the picture. Two of the biggest misconceptions about the top speed of a Formula One car actually had to do with the gearbox and gearing. So first, let's talk about gearing, why we need it, and how it impacts your top speed. We've already mentioned the power band of the engine, which is really important. Ideally, we'd like to keep the engine in this range whenever possible. And since the engine is connected to the wheels via the gearbox, the gear ratio also dictates the speed at which the vehicle can go in each gear. So in order to optimize the amount of power or torque being transmitted to the ground across a wide range of car speeds, we need to have gears and quite a few of them. To boil it all down, the gears do two things simultaneously. One, they multiply the amount of torque supplied by the crank and deliver that to the wheels. That's why your car accelerates much harder in first gear than in fourth, for example. Number two is they reduce the wheel speed relative to the engine speed by that same ratio. That's why the top speed of first gear is much lower than the top speed of fourth gear. So it's a trade-off between torque and speed in a gear. Now, here's something that a lot of people don't know. Formula One teams must select one set of gear ratios to use in all their gearboxes for the entire season. That's right. They have to use the same gear ratios at the fastest and at the slowest circuits. So now that we understand a little bit about how the gearing works and why we need it, we can debunk these first two big misconceptions about the top speed of a Formula One car. The third biggest misconception is that Formula One cars are gearing limited for top speed. Now, back in the V8 days when you had so many options for gears and final drives, yes, in many instances, the cars would be gearing limited for the top speed, but that's not the case now. Remember, we've got one set of gear ratios to use the entire season. So to prove this, let's look at Mexico, the highest top speed on the calendar. The top engine speed isn't over 13,000 RPM, but the engines are allowed to rev all the way up to 15,000 RPM. Now here's something else pretty cool that we can do with the data. If we take the eighth gear ratio and extrapolate all the way to 15,000 RPM, we can actually infer each team's top speed as limited by their gear ratio. And this actually becomes pretty interesting if you color the teams by engine manufacturer. You can see that most of the Ferrari powered cars could reach about 422 kilometers an hour. Now, all of the Mercedes powered cars, except for McLaren, have a substantially shorter gearing in eighth gear with a top speed of about 408. And then the Alpines went super long with nearly 430 kilometer an hour top gear. The fastest speed this season in qualifying was about 350 kph. All of the cars this season should be able to do well over 400 kilometers an hour, so we are not gearing limited. Misconception number three is completely resolved. Now, misconception number four is a little bit of a weird one, and I don't understand it, but I think I see where people are coming from. A lot of the comments said, if you had another longer gear, you could go faster. So imagine we had nine gears and one was longer. Well, this is completely incorrect. Imagine you're going up a really steep hill in your car in the middle of fourth gear. The hill is so steep that you're full throttle and you're not accelerating at all. You're just going at a constant speed up the hill. So what happens if you shift to fifth gear? Well, you're probably going to slow down because the torque at the wheels will very likely be less than it was in fourth gear. Now that's the fourth misconception solved, but we still don't actually know what limits the top speed of a Formula One car. Why do they not go faster? So we've talked about the 1000 horsepower acting through the gearbox, pushing the car forwards. But at the end of a long straight on most circuits, the cars are barely accelerating at all, and they're basically going a constant speed. Surely with that much power, Formula One cars should be able to go faster. So what's slowing them down? Well, there's actually a few things. Now there are a handful of very small factors, but one of the biggest factors slowing the cars down is the rolling resistance of the tires. Now, the rolling resistance depends on a lot of factors such as the vertical force, the inflation pressure of the tires, but this only makes up about five to 10% of the forces slowing down an F1 car at the end of a straight. So the remaining 90 to 95% of the forces, aerodynamic drag. Which brings us nicely to our fifth of six big misconceptions about the top speed of an F1 car. Formula One cars are very aerodynamic, so their low drag is completely incorrect. But I mean, look at them. Look how sleek they are. Look how small their frontal area is. There is no way that these cars generate a lot of drag, right? No, wrong. But rather than tell you this is all wrong, I'll explain how aerodynamic drag works and why F1 cars are so draggy. This next part might look a little bit intimidating, but as usual, I promise I'm gonna make this as easy as possible to understand. And with this bit of understanding, a lot more things are going to make sense about the way cars and everything else works. This is the formula for aerodynamic drag. The formula states that the drag force is equal to half the air density times the drag coefficient times the reference area 
times the speed squared. Now, I'll quickly explain the significance of each of these terms, then the whole top speed of an F1 car is going to make a lot more sense. And your technical knowledge is going to far surpass all of your mates at the pub. When designing a Formula One car, the only part of the equation the engineers have control over is this bit, the CD and the A. And in terms of an actual drag coefficient, a Formula One car is about as aerodynamic as a brick. If we look through a list of published drag coefficients, a Formula One car generates about three times more drag than most road cars. Now, part of this misconception that F1 cars are low drag comes from the fact that Formula One cars have a low frontal area or this A part of the term. So even though the frontal area is low, they still generate a load of drag. Low frontal area doesn't mean low drag at all. The whole area term is just a way to scale a given shape up or down depending on the size of the object. Please, for the love of God, do not make Formula One cars any bigger than they already are. So why are Formula One cars so draggy then? One of the reasons for the high drag is actually because of the wheels. They're big, they're exposed, they spin, they deflect, and they change shape. Not only does this generate a lot of drag, but it also gives the aerodynamicists another big headache. They get in the way of making downforce, which leads us to why Formula One cars generate so much drag. It's because they're engineered to generate downforce. These things are completely related, and this is called induced drag. Now, when you turn the air over the wings and all of the bodywork to push the tires into the ground harder, aka downforce, there's a byproduct. By turning that air to make the downforce, we also generate drag forces. So yes, the top speed of a Formula One car does vary event to event, but we still need to talk about the other terms in this equation in order to fully understand the massive force which is limiting the cars from going any faster. If we go back to the equation, the drag force is also proportional to the air density, and this is very important. That means when we go to circuits at higher altitudes such as Austria, Brazil, and Mexico City, the drag and down force of the car will actually be lower than the same car at sea level, which is pretty weird. If we look at the atmospheric pressure at all these altitudes, we can actually determine how much downforce and drag we have relative to that same car at sea level. At Austria and Brazil, we've lost just less than 10% compared to sea level. But if we go to Mexico City sitting at 2.4 kilometers above sea level, we've lost about 25% of our aero. And this is the main reason why the top speeds in Mexico City are always so high. But the top speed is pretty cool, but the altitude also means that we don't have much downforce and we also don't have much cooling. Less air, less airflow, less cooling, hot brakes, hot engines. Now this is actually pretty cool. For the slowest and fastest circuits on the F1 calendar, teams will typically run the same ultra high downforce and drag level. That's right, at Mexico and Monaco, the teams are gonna run the same ultra high downforce packages. Now we are at the final piece of the equation and about to understand the nature of the top speed limit of a Formula One car. And this is the most important part. The drag force is proportional to the speed squared. Now here's a very interesting way to visualize this and it kind of summarizes a few of the misconceptions. As the car speed increases, the drag force increases exponentially. Then if we plot the force generated at the ground by the engine in each gear, something interesting happens. Now, as we go through each gear and the car speed is increasing higher and higher, the torque or available force at the wheels decreases. And at some point, the drag force and the engine force cross over. Now, the fact that the drag force increases exponentially also means that in order to go just a little bit faster, it requires increasingly more and more power. It's outside of the scope of this video, but Formula One teams are not exactly interested in maximizing top speed. They are interested in minimizing lap time and different circuits require different levels of drag and downforce to go quickly. You can guarantee that there's gonna be another video on that. So now that we understand why Formula One cars don't go faster, we've got one final thing to settle. As for our sixth misconception, so many people said that a Formula One car will not decelerate at 1G when simply lifting off the throttle at the end of a long straight. That's absolutely crazy, right? Again, to put that in perspective, a G is about the most that your road car will decelerate if you absolutely slammed on the brakes. Now, most of that misconception has to do with the fact that a lot of people didn't appreciate how much drag a F1 car generates, but we can actually check this whole thing pretty quickly by hand using the information that we know already. Now, to make this a little bit easier to solve, we need to clarify a few assumptions. The acceleration at the end of a straight, we're gonna assume to be zero, and this is pretty close to correct. We're gonna also assume that it's all aerodynamic drag slowing the car down. Now, we did clarify that there was five to 10% of other losses coming from rolling resistance, but we'll just lump this into one term. The acceleration is zero. That means the power of the engine is equal to the power of the drag. The drag power is drag force times speed. The power of the engine is a thousand horsepower. We need to convert that to kilowatts. That's 745.7 .7 kilowatts. The top speed, we're gonna assume it's 320 kilometers an hour. 
we need to convert that to meters per second. That's 90.3 meters per second. Great assumption for the average circuit. We need to rearrange this equation now and solve it for the drag force. So the drag force is equal to power of the engine over speed. Now we'll substitute some of the values. We need to convert the correct units and we need to solve for the drag force. We also know that the minimum weight of the car is 795. So let's just use 800 kilos in this instance. Now, force equals mass times acceleration. We need to solve this for acceleration. Then we divide that number by gravity and there we have it just over one G. So the drag force acting on the car at the end of a long straight is enough to decelerate the car at over one G. Then you add the brakes on top of that and Formula One cars decelerate at well over five Gs. You don't need a wind tunnel to see this. Now you're smarter than most of F1 Twitter, F1 TikTok, and F1 Instagram all together. I hope you've enjoyed this video and you should definitely check out these race analysis videos from the 2022 season.